All right, good afternoon. So this presentation wants to show you how in CMS we are using um, the open source uh, cluster computing framework Apache Spark in order to perform uh, data analytics and, uh, and machine learning. So here the list of the contributors to this work. Um, at CERN, there are uh, Hadoop clusters that are featuring uh, about five petabytes of raw storage. And since uh, 2015, in their CMS has stored large sets of computing logs. They can be uh, job lifecycle, user profiles, uh, uh, resource utilizations, uh, file access logs. Uh, and um, so we evaluate Apache Spark uh, because it's scalability, because it's an efficient processing uh, uh, framework uh, of, uh, for, for, for a large set of data and uh, we leverage in memory and persistent API. And of course, on top of Apache, we can use a variety of languages on top of all Scala and, uh, and Python. And CMS uh, can benefit from Spark, uh, first of all, to reduce processing time on large data sets and also to perform machine learning studies and data analytics uh, on top of large data sets uh, from multiple data sources. Uh, essentially, I wanna show you uh, three use cases, site of utilization, that which tell us uh, which data sets, for example, occupy a given sites, user activities and daily statistics, uh, in order to know uh, what data is used or job throughput, and uh, then machine learning, some data set popularity. That is a concept that is very important to, to CMS, and it ranges from uh, fast queries for uh, the processing of monitoring time intervals to uh, the assessment of predictive models that can forecast uh, the, the data set uh, popularity. This table shows uh, uh, the list of uh, uh, data provider. So from these providers, uh, raw data are streamed to, to Hadoop. And uh, of course, uh, it's a lot of raw data, uh, billions of uh, uh, file access log from 2015 to 2017 from the sources. And uh, these billions of file access logs can be reduced to millions of samples once you aggregate them uh, by data sets and then down, down to thousands of data frame uh, which represent the input to machine learning algorithms. And uh, so uh, just to give you how impressive are these numbers, here you can see in the table the number of events uh, per data tier and uh, in the distributions uh, in log scale the number of uh, data sets uh, still by data tier and this shows you um, this highlights how it is important to have uh, uh, this kind of framework uh, because we can uh, really merge uh, uh, very complex and, uh, and uh, high number of raw data that would be uh, impossible with the, with the current uh, distributed data set infrastructure based on Oracle. And um, yeah, that's, that's the reason because, uh, well, with Spark, you uh, allow us to, to look at different angles, new angles of CMS data, uh, which otherwise would be impossible uh, using, using Oracle. And uh, in fact, it's easy to look at specific sites or slice data in different dimension. And uh, well, we can develop a lot of uh, uh, interesting and new monitoring tools. Um, these two plots, for example, shows you how it is affordable uh, time-wise uh, to use Spark because uh, oh, they give you an idea in um, how long it takes in seconds to reprocess uh, the current uh, uh, monitoring queries that are based on Oracle. So on the x-axis, you see a bunch of names, which are the popularity query uh, provided by materialized view in Oracle. And it doesn't matter whether you, which query you, you, we reprocess in Oracle or uh, whether we, we, we reprocess uh, a, a time interval of a month or, or a day. It's always a matter of few minutes. Whereas in Oracle, uh, the current system is just running 24-7, a, a continuous incremental materialized view updates. And uh, um, the other use case is machine learning on dataset popularity. Uh, so there are many definitions of popularity. Generally, uh, we say dataset is popular if it is used often in, in analysis jobs. And uh, the data placement uh, in several experiments is based on uh, dataset popularity. 
and this raises uh, uh, questions like, uh, can we predict the popularity of new data sets or uh, can we pre-compute the proper number of replicas? So uh, answers to this question would be very useful to make optimal choice of replication and uh, maximize the data availability. So we started from understanding the best popularity timestamp and uh, one week is the ideal timestamp for the popularity prediction. That means uh, given uh, uh, a certain number of historical information, we try to predict the popularity of data sets in the next week, in the week to come. So in, in, in the first plot, you see the number of data set access uh, uh, with two, consec two, weeks, two consecutive weeks and three consecutive weeks. And you see that uh, in the second case, uh, well, we have a, a, a reduction by 50%. And in the second plot, uh, in the log scale, uh, the number of data set access uh, uh, over uh, the full year of, of historical logs, uh, so 52, 53 weeks. And you see that the number of total weeks uh, is, uh, of course, higher than the number of consecutive weeks. And that means data set have a, a, a short access pattern. So increasing that week of prediction um, doesn't provide us uh, uh, the possibility to you know, to, to fully uh, understand the, the data set uh, uh, access uh, um, pattern. So that's why we stay with one week. And uh, the second step is to understand the ideal popularity cutoffs in order to label uh, the, each single data set as popular or unpopular. We can use several usage features, each one bringing different popularity uh, definitions. So we have uh, uh, data set size rather than number of accesses, number of users, CPU time of bias being read, and the blue line shows you the, the threshold that we're going uh, uh, to use to, to mark each data set as popular or not. Um, well, this, this flowchart just shows the complex uh, pipeline of Spark components which allows us, for example, from uh, AAA X through D logs files uh, in, in the over the last three years, uh, uh, well, to reduce them uh, after merging with a, with, with the file, uh, uh, with, with the block replica service, uh, reduce them in, in daily samples, weekly samples, and finally to the machine learning data frames. And I just want to focus your attention on the, num on the number because, uh, again, uh, from billions to a few thousands in a matter of uh, two, three hours. And, and of course, then when you play with the classification, uh, you start uh, in the usual way, you, you read the, 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 the input samples can be either CSV or SVM formats. And then we define the feature array, we make level point of features, and then we train and score the classifier using both Python, scikit-learn, or Scala machine learning loop. And the second one is not very effective as scikit-learn. In fact, a few algorithms are not yet implemented. And we also do compute classification probabilities by hand in some cases. However, in, in either two cases, uh, you, you come up with a lot of statistics, a lot of, uh, well, confusion matrix, uh, and we also plot uh, the, the raw curves. And here you see the difference between uh, um, two cutoffs, a number of access, and CPU time with number of access that provides uh, a better AUC. Uh, this this basic model then uh, is also improved uh, with, with several techniques. Uh, we, we perform feature engineering, so we add additional features from the, the basic ones. We also um, employ site level models. That is, uh, we try to exploit the data set locality at some sites. On the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the picture to the left, uh, you see the number of access by, by site ID. and. Um, and also, uh, on, the, on, on the picture to the, to the right, um, we, we try to understand how a, a given model ages or needs to be refreshed. And uh, for example, the red line is the static model. That means you train the model and then you, you score it over the, the, the following weeks, uh, nine weeks, and, and you see the, the accuracy of the model but you never update it anymore. Then the reinforced model, it means that every week you add new samples. But of course, the reinforced model performs better than the static one. And finally, the sliding window, every week uh, we replace the, the oldest window, uh, with the oldest, the oldest samples with, uh, with the ones in the new week uh, 
Uh, and uh, that's very important that the sliding window report is the best one because it means uh, there is some data set aging in the, in the input sample. Uh, another uh, activity that we have done uh, starting from the popularity prediction is uh, implementing a new, uh, a new data set caching strategy. So whenever a site gets full, uh, we, do not, we, we do not evict uh, the data set that is popular, if it is popular the next week. Um, here you see uh, the heat rates uh, versus uh, uh, different cache sizes and our policy is called PPC, Popularity Prediction Caching, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the blue line. And we compare PPC against uh, LRU, uh, least recently used, and also STC. STC stands for Static Dynamic Caching. It's an algorithm that is proven to be effective uh, for, uh, well, for caching uh, engine, search engine uh, query qu qu results. And, um, and also you can see the upper bound, which is given by OPT, which is the Bellady algorithms, so the theoretical optimus, because uh, it means uh, uh, whenever you need to, to, to replace a data set, uh, a data set um, will be replaced, the, the data set that is not needed for the longest time in the future. So that's the theoretical upper bound. And also we have read the uh, uh, upper bound for our PPC, PPC star, which is the perfect classifier, the 100% accurate classifier. So bottom line from this plot, you can see that this policy uh, always outperform uh, LRU and its variation, and in particular is very effective for very small cache sites, which make it very effective for uh, sites with limited capacity. Of course, we don't use Spark out of the box. We play a lot of optimization with the cluster settings, and we try to use uh, um, persistence and, uh, and uh, distributed uh, uh, features as much as possible. We use either Scala and Python. Scala, uh, well, Spark is written in Scala, so if you go for Scala, you don't have um, uh, language translation in between. And also Scala comes with um, data frame and uh, resilient distributed data set parallelism out, out of the box. Whereas Python is uh, much known in high energy physics, but PySpark requires some additional training. It is, uh, the, the, basically, it is the Spark Python uh, API. In general, the program throughput uh, depends on the structure, on the structure. So uh, our approach is always to use uh, uh, data frame operation instead of iteration. And uh, in, uh, in, in essence, so Spark is an extremely used platform uh, to, to, to process large, uh, large data sets and uh, CMS uh, really benefits from, uh, from this platform. And um, XRUD data set popularity in particular is very important for, for our operation and uh, it has fueled a lot of activity in, uh, in uh, computing analytics and machine learning. So far, the best approach for us is to run analytics with Scala because, as I said, the RDB and data frame uh, built in features and then run machine learning with PySpark because at that moment the sample set is, is smaller and, uh, well, and, and the machine learning library, the cycle is the state of the art. And finally, work in progress besides the data set caching uh, uh, policy that you have seen, we are also working at data set placement, so the application of data set predictive models to, uh, to the replicas.